I'm Ray Suarez. The NewsHour's Global Health Unit has come to Guatemala. March 8th is International Women's Health Day. We'll be looking at efforts to reduce violence against women and girls and take a look at family planning in a country accustomed to large families and the heavy influence of the church. Ray Suarez explores the possibilities of personalizing gun technology. This is button number one, number two, number three, and number four. At a firing range in Southern California, Belinda Padilla prepares to demonstrate a new gun. The gun knows if you're allowed to fire it. Well, let's see. The red light on the handgun indicates Padilla is not the owner. And then he takes it back and it'll just Rev up again, he doesn't have to do anything. Huh? Oh, well, there's the green light. I have a green indication. Armatix hopes to have its owner-authorized gun available for sale in the U.S. this fall. In the first of three reports for our Global Health Unit, Ray Suarez, just back from Cuba, reports on how that's working. Is Cuba ready for big economic change? Like everything about this country, it depends on who you ask, and where, you ask. In Havana, Rafael Hernandez is a political scientist and writer. The leadership is realizing that this is a key strategic moment. We took a quick tour of Havana's historic core, powered by a former accountant who now makes more money, as much as 8 to $10 a day, peddling Cubans around. Hernandez says his country is moving away from state control, but not toward capitalism. We are investing on cooperatives more than in a state or just private. But is change coming? Cubans have heard it before, and in previous decades, the government opened the door a crack to the development of a small business sector, only to pull back the reforms by refusing to issue more new licenses. John Park Wright says it doesn't have to be that way. We had uh, three of the best ranches in the world here in Cuba, uh, in the eastern part of the island. Wright's family owned some of the biggest ranches in Cuba for more than a century. He travels from Florida to Cuba under special agricultural licenses. He's shipped a thousand head of cattle here and wishes he could send a lot more, he says, to benefit both countries. We'd want to come right back in business and raise cattle here, so we'd take an investment, professional cattlemen from Florida and Texas, and uh, just kind of getting back uh, on the range here. And you, you, there's no beef in the country to speak of, so uh, we're talking about putting meat on the table. And, and plus, they have some of the best cattlemen in the country. Cowboys uh, here are good people. Wright laments the decline of the Cuban cattle and dairy industry, but says trade and American expertise can make the island more self-sufficient and better fed. Recently, researchers at the University of New Mexico wanted to ask a basic question. Would a country with a heavier burden of disease also be a country with a population that's less able to learn. In other words, would disease burden, especially in early childhood, result in a country with a lower cognitive potential? Well, in order to answer the question, they ran the numbers and the statistics were readily available from all around the world, sampled by international organizations, NGOs, the United Nations. And they found a nearly 100% correlation Countries with a heavier burden of disease, especially in earlier childhood, end up with a national measurable IQ that's lower. Well, obviously that's a tough stat to report on, a controversial statistic to report on, and brings all kinds of uh, backlash about uh, attitudes toward color, toward poverty, uh, toward geography even. But we interviewed one of the lead researchers, and he said, no, no, this can be a basic tool in policy making, because instead of putting a lot of emphasis all over the cycle of life, you may be able to get a tremendous result just by lifting the burden of disease among the youngest children. So the Global Health Unit for the News Hour has come to Mozambique, one of the poorest countries in the world, and one of the countries with the heaviest burden of disease in young children, to ask, is that 
a worthwhile approach toward national and economic development. This idea that lifting the disease burden in heavily affected populations would have a direct impact, would feed right into a country's ability to work hard and well to create a wealthier future. So we'll have a lot of material here online. And of course, as always, we recommend that you check out the story on the broadcast and later on here online as well. And comment on the blog. Um, if you want to have ask more questions, if you want to make some comments, uh, I'll take a look at what you have to say and answer you directly if, uh, if you want to talk that way. So um, with the online news hour, with the online news hour here in Mozambique on Africa's Indian Ocean coast, I'm Ray Suarez. During his more than 30-year career, journalist Ray Suarez has reported for a variety of news agencies, including National Public Radio and Al Jazeera America. And he spent nearly 15 years as a correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. He's also an author. Some areas of focus have been on Latino American history and the way that faith and politics intersect. He's currently helping students at Amherst College understand more about that through a course titled From the Moral Majority to the Rise of the Nuns. The uh, battles are intensifying over religious messages, religious symbols in public space. Instead of uh, taking a little bit of the pressure out of those fights, it's actually building up the confrontation because mm -hmm. those who still are uh, heavily religiously influenced or digging in their heels and saying this is America, this is American culture, this is an essential part of our history. And the unaffiliated is saying, look, you're, it's speaking for the government when you put a nativity scene on the steps of City Hall. It's not neutral speech. It's an interesting battle because along with that separation of church and state, there's always been a kind of live and let live attitude toward these things. Nobody says you can't use public streets for a religious procession, let's say. So in Italian communities, in Brooklyn, in the mill towns of, uh, of Massachusetts, uh, the saint would be paraded uh, through the streets. The men of the congregation would carry this enormous thing, a tower on their shoulders. Nobody would say, oh, you, you have to use, do that only on church land. There was a kind of rough accommodation for everybody involved. And now we're seeing just conflict. Hmm.